uh, that should be here to present Professor Wolfgang Kramer, but uh, we... Ah! It was just one minute to wait for Tiag Domingues. <laughs> Sorry, I was just in the next room finishing the previous symposium and had a wrong, um, had the wrong timing in the calendar. So, well, I'm ready now. So, uh, it is my uh, pleasure to welcome, albeit late, uh, <laughs> M late on my side, uh, welcome uh, Wolfgang Kramer uh, to this uh, to this conference. Um, uh, Wolfgang is an environmental geographer and global ecologist, and is the scientific director at the Mediterranean Institute for Biodiversity and Ecology in Aix-en-Provence. Uh, since the establishment of the institute, and I'd say is uh, the main uh, driving force of the the creation of this of this institute. Uh, Wolfgang has a very uh, extensive and very influential uh, scientific uh, scientific output, um, starting uh, with the analysis of forest dynamics under global change, but then moving to the understanding of vegetation dynamics a long time uh, at the biosphere uh, scale, and hence uh, and creating very influential models for that. Uh, which uh, can now be uh, used for understanding the carbon cycle, the effect of vegetation on climate, the effect of land use on vegetation and hence on, and on, hence on climate. Uh, he has uh, played a very influential role in leading very influential research projects in these areas and uh, also in the very closely connected areas of, uh, of ecosystem services. And he has been a contributor to the IPCC, to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and to multiple policy processes uh, in Germany and in the European Union and at the global scale. And so uh, with this, uh, I ask you for, um, uh, to welcome uh, Wolfgang for his talk. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you. Well, I, I feel, can you hear me? Yes, I, I feel almost embarrassed by that, by that long introduction, but thank you very much for, for having me here. And uh, before starting, I would like to pay a small tribute to, the, to all the young scientists that are at this conference. I know you, I thought about this and I realized you probably worked much harder to even get here than, than I did because I was just pleasantly invited and be sent and provided with a ticket. So, so uh, I think it's great that so many young people are here and the message that I'm trying to pass on today is of course uh, intended for everyone, but particularly perhaps for you. Um, the actual submitted title didn't make it into the program, but this is more or less what I intended to talk about. Uh, what is needed uh, to, for better decision, decision making in the Mediterranean Basin on environmental issues? Uh, is there some way science, environmental sciences can help to improve the situation? Now, uh, does, what's this way? I'd like to make an assumption first, and I declare it is an assumption. It's not an, uh, a proven hypothesis or observation, maybe even, but the assumption is that public and private decision makers, they will actually do more to protect the environment if they have sufficient and reliable knowledge about upcoming risks. That could almost be considered as a cynical statement by some people who say that yeah, government policy makers are only interested in their short-term benefits or something like that, but uh, I have, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I've, had, I've met many policymakers and uh, also private decision makers in the Mediterranean and elsewhere who do actually have a genuine interest in information and in better information. And this is basically what, what drives me. And those decision makers who do not have this, well, I don't, want, I don't need to speak to them. There's enough, <laughs> there's enough people who actually want to move and enough people who actually want to improve the situation. Also, as a little bit element of context, let me say that climate change, which is a, pre, uh, a dominant topic for me and will also be relatively dominating through this talk, it's of course not the only aspect of uh, environmental change, in, not in the Mediterranean, not elsewhere. Uh, environmental change is, is everything that is changing for the people, and that could be uh, pollution, that could be uh, sea level rise, which may be seen as, as climate change, that could be invasive species or anything. The approach that I uh, try to pursue and, and present 
aims at covering all of these um, and aims even at finding out which ones are perhaps more important than others. I want to make largely six points in this talk uh, for the Mediterranean basin. I want to speak briefly about recent trends following up on what Ricardo said yesterday. Uh, speak a little bit ob ob about observed impacts of environmental change in the Mediterranean, their causes, how do we actually go on to risk projections, uh, and uh, of then making this, this point that is particularly close to my heart, we need to be explicit and supportive for any kind of effort to interface between science and policy. Um, but we also need to realize that civil society has its own uh, role to play and, and, uh, and a particular responsibility. Recent trends, there's nothing surprising for you to see another, yet another temperature curve for global, for global warming. That's just one of, the, one of the trends and there's many different ways how we can, how we can show that. Uh, this is not even the most recent one. It would look more dramatic if I had this updated. Uh, another one is sea level rise, um, which is uh, a, a particular relevant topic in the Mediterranean and also elsewhere, as I will explain a little bit later. You could go on, and you've seen these uh, uh, illustrations by Johan Rockström and others, where basically you can have a whole panel of curves that go from the left, from the bottom left to the top right, and this is like why we are here, and this is where the concern comes from. Also, just to follow up uh, on what we heard yesterday about the heat waves, uh, the, we are of course just uh, at the end of two, two heat waves which that have affected much of Europe <coughs> and uh, particular also areas that are not so much used to heat waves such as the UK and, and northern Germany and the Netherlands. Um, at the global scale, uh, it can also not be disputed that there's, uh, that there's warming going on. Um, this, I like this way of depicting it because it shows two things. First of all, it shows that there are still areas of the globe where we do not have good data. Um, and, and some of the disagreement between different global data sets uh, are related to the methods that exist to estimate the, the changes in those areas where data are sparse. I don't have time to go into that, but this is important. Also sometimes on land, like in central uh, Brazil and in central Africa, uh, there is just insufficient data and actually the data is getting worse. Uh, there are, of course, satellite products, but there's, uh, there are fewer and fewer meteorological stations. And if we talk about long-term meteorological research, we also have to have long-term weather observations for, the, for, for any point of the, of the world. <coughs> um, this is a picture for precipitation over land, uh, ch observed changes during the second half of the 20th century. And you already see a little bit brownish in there. Um, this, is, this is actually over here. Uh, the, the Mediterranean shows up mostly as an, as an area where there's not just warming, but there's, there's um, a reduced precipitation. Uh, this uh, slide was, I think, already shown by someone before. Uh, this was our attempt to compare the trend in the Mediterranean with the global trend for the, for the observational period. And, uh, and you can see that there's, whether or not one can use percentages for temperature, let that be a, a separate uh, methodological point, but you see that there's a significantly faster warming in the Mediterranean uh, than there is elsewhere. This is shocking sometimes to people, and then they say, what's so spe special about the Mediterranean? And we have to then admit, of course, there are other areas in the world too that have uh, uh, faster rates of warming than, than the, the global average. It just happens that many of them, as Ricardo showed, many of them are Mediterranean-type climates. And also it happens to be the case that in many of them there are a lot of people living there. So uh, in general, I haven't done the analysis yet, but in general if you, if you look at the populated parts of the world, uh, you already feel, uh, f uh, you already notice a, a faster rate of global change than you if you look at the entire globe. And this is, um, this is of course a separate concern. <coughs> And it's not just temperatures that are changing and rainfall, but there's also changes in sea level that have been observed and that are, are ongoing. This picture for the Mediterranean shows that it's a really complex situation, uh, both for absolute sea level uh, change, at, as it is depicted here, with even some areas uh, experiencing reduced sea level and, and others uh, increasing sea level. But I will come back to this question. Um, and why it, is, uh, why it is perhaps of less concern that there's this variability, spatial variability in the Mediterranean than we used to think. 
One indication, this is a, a, a tweet uh, based on, a, on an article that came out yesterday. Uh, this week alone, Greenland will lose about 50 billion tons of ice, uh, which is enough for a permanent rising global sea level by about 0 0.1 millimeter. Let that sink in a little bit. I mean, this is an observation. This is not modeling. This is uh, uh, not some fancy uh, mathematics. It's just an observation from Greenland as uh, of the situation that happens right now. Other changes uh, that are, are uh, of importance for the Mediterranean are that, they may, like other parts of the global ocean, the Mediterranean is acidifying. Uh, the, the reason is simple. The increased uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere leads to a net flux of, uh, uh, of CO2 into the ocean, and the ocean, in a way, gives us a service because it absorbs not only heat but also, also CO2. But this absorption of CO2 by the ocean uh, implies an acidification, which is, if you look at the numbers, so far observed numbers, they're not really dramatic yet, but they're very easy to, to, to scale up uh, forwards with, with um, you don't need a complex model to do that, to, to see that within decades uh, we can reach a situation which is much more dramatic with regarding to acidification. Then there are non-climatic uh, aspects such as the arrival of uh, invasive species or alien organisms, no, however you want to, to term them. And of course, there's a connection between these and the, and the, and the rates of warming. Uh, let's not deny that. But as um, these maps also indicate, there's actually a strong influence simply from the physical existence of the Suez Canal and from the, from the recent enlargement of the Suez Canal, which is basically an invitation for many species from the Red sea and further southeast to, to enter into the Mediterranean, which they couldn't have done otherwise. And uh, on land, I think some, this slide has also been shown uh, already earlier on the first day that uh, there are, of course, many organisms, both animals and plants, that arrive in quantities that, and uh, spread in quantities in, in Europe, that, and Mediterranean Europe particularly, that, that have not been observed before. And all of this meets a uh, human population depending on how you exactly delineate the, um, uh, the, the, the basin. Uh, you can talk about 250 to 400 million people, so a very large uh, number of people, and this number is, of course, growing. The, um, we have had some remarks earlier about Paul Ehrlich and, and uh, population growth. It's clear that in the Mediterranean, population is growing, particularly in the megacities in the south, but also, um, for example, one aspect of migration to the Mediterranean that we need to take into account as well is the migration of people like myself who come from the north and who just uh, who decide to, to live in the Mediterranean. We are quite, there's quite a number of us and it's interesting to, to uh, and, there, and in summer of course there are even more uh, temporary uh, tourism. I don't speak much about tourism today. So uh, the Mediterranean is a hotspot also of population growth on the planet. Uh, so what, do, what changes do we observe in terms of these uh, changes in the environment? This is a picture, well, this is a picture from the 2003 heat wave and it's not taken in Australia or, or, or the Sahel. This is uh, central France, not in the south of France, central France. Uh, the heat wave of 2003 it didn't only uh, lead to premature death of rather a high number of the, of, the, of the people, but also to significant losses in, in biomass and, and sub subsequently agricultural production in the area. What is less known perhaps to some people is that there are heat waves in the ocean as well, and those heat waves uh, are usually the main cause for coral bleaching, even in the tropics, but, but also to a uh, to the degree that there are corals or cor corallogenous um, uh, ecosystems in the, in the Mediterranean. These also bleach, and they bleach particularly during those heat waves. And so it's not just the, the increase of the, of the average temperature, it's actually the, the increase of uh, the length and uh, uh, intensity of those heat waves. And then I want to appreciate the very good discussion we had yesterday about fire, because um, this is also one of, uh, like everybody on the street uh, immediately recognizes that, that fire uh, risk and fire intensity uh, is uh, probably related to, to warming. 
But as our discussion uh, yesterday pointed out, that is, while that is true, there are also another, a couple of additional factors, uh, such as the, uh, the amount of fuel that we are let to be in the landscape and the relationship between uh, the, the shape of the modern landscapes today or the look of the modern landscapes today and the decline of agro-pastoralism that has basically kept the, kept the landscapes open. And there's, I think, a significant um, agricultural management issue there if we can somehow return to a state where there's less fuel in the landscape and the landscapes are used for, for other purposes, such as grazing animals. Um, an additional case of uh, observed changes, observed impacts are very high intensity rainfall events. Uh, this is in Cannes in southern France. Uh, they also come as climatic events, but they also come together with uh, local changes in the system that are actually hit. For example, here in the, in the suburbs of Cannes, a lot of the soil is sealed. And uh, if you have a lot of rain on them, then actually it's not absorbed by the, by the ground at all. It's, it leads to much more flooding than you would normally have in a, in a kind of um, gre uh, uh, landscape, uh, more traditional landscape. <coughs> the attribution of these events to climate change is often disputed or is, is put into question. I don't have the time to get, go into the details of that, but usually you cannot say that a particular heavy windstorm or rainstorm is due to climate change as such, but you can very easy, quite easily show that its intensity is increased and, sub uh, and substantially worse uh, in the presence of, uh, of global warming than it would have been in a, in a situation without global warming. And then there's, of course, the cases of, of this is also related to the storms, but also to sea level rise, the, the coastal flooding and the coastal impacts that, um, that I find per, uh, perhaps to be one of the most significant um, uh, changes, both observed changes and future risks in the Mediterranean. Venice is a, is a city that knows very well uh, its situations with aqua alta, with, with, uh, with um, flooding of, of, the, of the town. But uh, it has been shown that the frequency and duration of these uh, events is increasing due to uh, global sea level rise and regional sea level rise. And, uh, and this is, of course, a big concern because Venice actually needs uh, recovery time after each flooding event in order to, uh, to, to even exist. And the costs are, of course, very high to protect, us, uh, protect this piece of natural, of historical heritage in the, in the Mediterranean basin. And if you then look at it, you realize that it's not only Venice. There are other, other coastal uh, places with, uh, with a big patrimonial value that are put at risk um, uh, by, by sea level rise. And there are uh, regions where sea level rise and increased flooding already affect uh, the estuaries of the, of the big rivers. This is in the Camargue, um, where essentially a, piece, a significant share, a part of the Camargue is already being giving, given up to sea level rise because uh, the cost would be too high to maintain those dikes and to ensure that, that, the, that the system would survive. You may not think of that as a, as a big dramatic problem because these are not the most fertile and agricultural, uh, agricultural systems, but uh, one should remember that other parts of the Mediterranean, notably the Nile Delta and, and uh, also the river deltas of the Po and the Ebro, are intensively used in important agricultural regions and that a lot of uh, livelihoods are, are being affected if those uh, agricultural soils are either affected by flooding or by, so by salinization of the groundwater resource or a combination of the two. So there are um, good or good uh, strong indications that we actually for much of the southern part of the, of the Mediterranean move towards a form of desertification, a condition with, with a significantly drier uh, um, situation overall, loss of agricultural land, and basically a, re a strong reduction of, of uh, production capacity of food for the local uh, population. <coughs> I cannot uh, d make this talk without briefly showing this, this map, this global map, which is from the, from the IPCC, from the last major IPCC report, where we developed a formal method to attribute uh, change in, um, in uh, any change in observer, observed either in ecosystems or in social systems or in hydrological systems 
to climate change. Because in all these cases, when you look closely, there's always this argument how much of it is climate change, how much is perhaps land use change, such as the decline of agro-pastoralism or, or other factors. Um, here now, this, this was the first time that a really detailed and formalized attribution study was made uh, at the global scale, and invite you to, to read the relevant chapter in, in the IPCC report. Coming back um, to these changes and what causes them, again, uh, the temperature curve, that goes without saying. Uh, what I, why I'm showing this um, greenhouse gas uh, concentrations curve is to remind you that we're not talking about CO2 only. We're talking about other, uh, other greenhouse gases, and particularly methane is one that is of, of concern at the moment because it has uncertainties. And like many of these uncertainties, uh, there is um, a, a suspicion at the moment that methane uh, emission rates might increase substantially uh, faster in the future than has been recently estimated or observed. Um, but this is, this is somewhat of an, of an open question right now. What we do know is that the CO2 uh, uh, emissions are almost unmitigated, uh, increasing. Uh, there are sometimes little wiggles in the curve, but it's, it's pointing upwards and it's somehow somewhat close to the, to the uh, worst estimates that the IPCC has been presenting over the years. If you ever want to know what the current uh, greenhouse gas emissions are, I, I invite you to go to the website of the Global Carbon Project, which uh, provides excellent uh, both data and, and observations and um, illustrations every year about these cases. The, from them is also this, um, uh, you've already seen the triple curves up there, but you, uh, the, the bottom panel shows you where essentially from which activ activities those CO2 emissions come from. Of course, the big, 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 great triangle is from fossil fuel, cement, and flaring, uh, cement production and flaring, but there is a significant contribution. It looks kind of small here, but it's really millions of tons of CO2 from uh, what they call uh, forestry and other land use, which is somewhat a euphemism, I would say, for the destruction of tropical forests in both Southeast Asia and, and, and Latin America, um, with a big risk, of course, that the current uh, politics in Brazil and elsewhere might lead to rather an increase of this than, than the decline that we've seen recently. A more detailed assessment about, uh, of these greenhouse gas emissions and where they come from by economic sectors is provided by the IPCC. I don't have the time to go, to go through this um, here in detail, you see, but, but you see the, the, what was brown in the previous one, the agriculture, forestry, land use uh, bit is quite significant. The other two major players are transport and industry, and uh, I will come back to the transport in a moment. If you think about industrial production and, the, and how it is causing climate change, then uh, you have to consider this map, which is also from the Global Carbon Project. It basically shows, or it basically recognizes that a lot of the greenhouse, the recently increasing greenhouse gas emissions are in China. But why are they in China? Because in Ch China produces the goods and, uh, that, that we are consuming and, and buying uh, in, in North America and in Europe. So if you attribute greenhouse gas, gas emissions per capita, on the planet, then you have to take this into account. You basically have to take our own emissions here plus the emissions that are, made, that are coming from China and other producing countries um, as a consequence of our own consumption. Just a reminder of that. So how do we get into the risk projections? Uh, how do we find out whether this actually matters for us and our children? Um, climate models have become uh, are, now, are now pretty reliable and the, the sh sort of simplest and most straightforward uh, illustration that the IPCC provides for uh, expected uh, temperature changes in, uh, in the world is, is this contrast basically of four different families of, of, um, of scenarios. Scenarios, I remind you, scenarios are different assumptions about socioeconomic development. They're not assumptions about the climate. The climate is the same climate system that just responds to different degrees of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and aerosols and other, other factors. And you see here that the, like the most um, optimistic case is the RCP 2.6 scenario, uh, which is still slightly above uh, Paris in its, in its warming, uh, warming rate. This is um, 
of course, from now, not from pre-industrial. But the, um, the, the worst case, or the worst case, the current business as usual is this one that's, that's increasing. And you will see later other slides that follow the same color coding so that you, uh, you can compare that. More interesting, perhaps, again, is the spatial pattern of, of these changes. And uh, this was also already said yesterday at the polls, and uh, in, in particular the northern Arctic and subarctic regions, but also Europe uh, and North America are much more affected by this warming than, than uh, areas further uh, at lower latitudes. Uh, the picture is more complicated for the rainfall changes. The only thing I want to point out again is that the Mediterranean stands out as an area with significant reduction of, of rainfall. And what, is, what the picture is not showing is that this is one of the areas where climate models, despite their uncertainty on rainfall estimates, agree the most. Uh, essentially, you, you, uh, for rainfall, you could say there's big variation between global climate models, but most of them showing very similar patterns for the Mediterranean. We have asked the question for the Mediterranean, um, uh, how does, uh, do these different scenarios of warming compare to the past variability in the, in the Holocene? Um, essentially, these black bars here, they show observed uh, changes in the Holocene, um, uh, in Holocene vegetation derived from, from pollen, from a large assemblage of, of uh, um, paleoecological databases. And you can see there's, of course, fluctuation. Um, there, there are drier periods and there are wetter periods, and so vegetation, natural vegetation changes systematically, but only to a degree. And, uh, and what we see here with the four curves from the climate scenarios is that only if you create a, what we call a Paris uh, compliant scenario of not more than 1.5 degrees, only then will you stay within the range of the uh, Holocene variability. And any other uh, warming scenario, which are, of course, more, more likely at the moment to occur than, than the 1.5, they, uh, they let us go into uncharted territory that is outside the Holocene variation. Another indicator in the same sort of uh, representation, um, sea ice extent in the, in the northern hemisphere. And this, I show this one particularly because at some point uh, for these scenarios, the uncertainty goes away. And when does it go away? When you, when you hit zero, then there's no more a question. If there, if there is actually uh, a little bit more, a little bit less, you're just at zero. The, the ice is just gone. And this needs to be remembered that for some of these factors, there may be uncertainty, there may be wiggles along the way at some point, but if you have a dramatic enough in, uh, forcing, then, uh, then you hit basically the, the roof or the wall or however you call it, and then the system is, has changed uh, fundamentally in its, in its structure. Similar uh, picture for ocean pH, for acidification. Um, it's an open area of, uh, of research at the moment, exactly how much, uh, what that means and how, uh, what feedback systems exist, exist in the ocean biosphere. But um, it's clear that if, again, if you have uh, a, a reduction in pH of, of uh, oops, of, um, sorry, <laughs> of, uh, from, from 8.1 to 7.7, .7, uh, that means a total change of the chemical environment for, for marine ecosystems, and particularly for calciferous um, uh, organisms, but also for others. How does this now affect people? This is a study uh, for Mediter Eastern Mediterranean and uh, MENA cities uh, made by Jos Lellifeld a, a couple of years ago, where they looked at the summer extreme or warmest temperatures uh, for, for, major, uh, for these major cities. And they basically show that, that um, by the end of, um, uh, by the period 2070 to 2099, the total distribution has, has flipped. I mean, it's no longer just a little bit of a displacement into some area. Basically, the, what is today the warmest conditions in the, in the variability, they are, they, are then, they are still colder than what then is the cold, coldest maximum temperatures. It's a little bit complicated to get around this argument, but the point is really that uh, in big cities, the warming is so significant that you either have to have a lot more air conditioning or uh, you are essentially going to suffer. The IPCC over the years has developed these kinds of diagrams that are, have become rather popular. They're called the burning embers diagrams, and they uh, essentially show on the scale from white to dark purple uh, the risks that are associated with different levels of warming uh, for different systems. They have also been criticized because it's very hard 
to, to make a very objective determination of where precisely you are with, your, with, the, with the majority of your systems on these scales. But usually with an with a expert elicitation approach where you, where you consider many, many systems together and you argue long enough about it, there is usually quite some good consensus for these, for these figures. And you, you then, of course, you see that warm water chorus, for example, we are already deep in the red. We are already losing them at a fast rate. And we are also seeing significant cases of coastal flooding, for example. Uh, others are perhaps less dramatic, but, uh, but uh, equally uh, of concern here in this range between 1.5 and 2 degrees, which is what the Paris Agreement is about. A brief look again at these sea level uh, variations. This is a. Uh, when you first see it, you get a little bit shocked by this picture. It, it mirrors the one that I showed before. It shows some areas where the sea level is rising, some area where sea level is, is, is uh, sinking, uh, which shows that the Mediterranean is, of course, a complex basin with river, rivers uh, determining much of it and, and air pressure. Uh, and this is overall, this is fluctuating. But you have to bear in mind two things. One is there are no tides, except uh, for some areas, which means that at any given location, the assumption of people when they install uh, housing, ports, uh, any structure on the coast is that the sea level is where it is. Not like in the north, in, in northern France or in, 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 uh, in the Netherlands, where you know there's a lot, lot of fluctuation and you better stay away from that fluctuation. The Mediterranean system is essentially built for no fluctuation. And the second is that these numbers here of millimeters per year, <coughs> they are actually dwarfed by, by the numbers that you have to take into account when you when you look at, uh, at global sea level rise, and of course global sea level rise uh, forces uh, Mediterranean sea level rise, they become a little bit irrelevant, those, those uh, local differences, if we go into this situation. And here the red curve that I mentioned before for the various other factors, it is so steep that uh, somehow um, the, the uncertainty that nevertheless exists up here, that uncertainty is very dramatic because if you were a little bit wrong, then you can have a lot less, theoretically, or a lot more uh, sea level rise. And this is why for the Mediterranean, if you want to make predictions about Mediterranean coastal situations, you actually have to go to Greenland and Antarctica to understand the system. And you have to ask yourself, where, if there is sea level rise, where does it actually come from? And, uh, and this is what I find, uh, I cut this very short, but what I find very um, uh, of, of very great concern for Mediterranean conditions that we seem to be constantly underestimating Antarctic deglaciation. We have been underestimating Greenland uh, deglaciation for quite some time. I know very serious and they're not climate skeptics, but very serious glaciologists who have told me only a few years ago, yeah, but you know, Greenland, these are these long time scales and so on. And now every couple of Weeks. I mean, you saw the notice from, la from, from uh, last night. Uh, we get n messages that Greenland is melting much faster than it used to. And then the same glaciologists go, but you know, but Antarctica has been there for hundreds of thousands of years. It's not going to change. And of course, it's not going to completely deglaciate. But it's deglaciating, uh, it's losing ice, particularly uh, here under these coastal uh, ice shelves. Uh, that is much fast, uh, it's difficult to observe, you don't see it from satellite or anything like that. You have to actually go there and drill and do, do other complicated studies and you have to do it, some modeling as well to, in order to understand it. But it turns out, and this was this paper by, <coughs> uh, yeah, by uh, De Conto exactly, De Conto and Pollard uh, two or three years ago, they were essentially saying um, there's a risk that this, there's a, we, you can only explain the past behavior of sea level if you actually take this into account. I'm running a short on time, yes, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so these are, the, these are the, the risks and there are many more of them that we, that we project. And now I want, just want to make some point that you have to meet the decision makers and communicate that risk. Because the assumption was, if you remember, that the policy action maker actually wants to know this. Now, we have had political goal statements 
that have been developed after extensive consultation with societal actors. One less well known is the Barcelona Convention, but it's actually older than the other two uh, on, on this map. It was initially about pollution in the Mediterranean, but now it's about uh, all environmental change. We have the very famous Rio Conventions for Climate Change, Biodiversity, Desertification, and Wetlands, and we have the Sustainable Development Goals. So we know what we are shooting for. We know better than we used to do 10 years ago why we are, why we are doing all this communication effort. The Paris Agreement is a milestone. Uh, why? Because for the first time, uh, governments in, in the negotiations for the Climate Convention have been considering the science more explicitly than, than before. And they have basically said, OK, you're telling us about this two degrees level. Uh, we are realizing that some of our member states are even going to disappear at two degrees. So this is of a significant concern. We actually have to uh, come to a way how we can reach those two degrees and, uh, if possible, pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase even further to 1.5 degrees above uh, the pre-industrial. Remember, we are at about one degree already. And also, of course, the secondary goal aims to strengthen the ability of countries to, de to deal with the impacts of climate change. Now, how to actually inform the decision makers? And who is the decision maker? Is it just the heads of state that have signed the Paris Agreement? No, it's, it's all levels of government, from the international levels like Europe, and the national to the local, but it's also businesses and citizens and even NGOs. And now the case that I want to make and that I hope really goes home with, with every one of you is that those assessment reports by the IPCC and by IPBES and by others are really important documents and they really require all of our support and also our attention. They're the best effort that science can do to, in order to, to, um, uh, to provide information. And to providing that remains essentially acceptance, this mantra which gets like burn into your head when you start working with this. It must, your work must be policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. And why is this? Because the policy maker is actually a serious professional person, him or her as well. And you have to recognize that. If you don't recognize that, then basically there will be no dialogue. If you step out and say, you should do this and that, and otherwise I'm not, I'm not going to talk to you, just on a human level it will not work. And this is why there's this, this mantra on uh, policy relevance and policy prescriptiveness. I was going to talk more about the 1.5 degree report, but uh, there, there's uh, not enough time. I just remind you that the statement by the IPCC, and it's a very detailed report, which, I, which is really worth reading in many of its parts. Um, if, you, if we want to, we can remain below even 1.5 degrees. But then we have to act very fast and we have to act uh, in, on, on, in systems and in, on levels that are perhaps unthinkable from a societal point of view. But from a physical and biological and biogeochemical uh, uh, consideration, we still have a few years where we can install changes that actually will allow us to, to, to stay below 1.5 or 2 degrees. Uh, the wording in the, in the 1.5 degree report is that we need multiple and profound transformations of the production and use of energy. And just two quick um, examples, not uh, getting you all the way to 1.5, but to show that there's the very existence of the uh, Paris Agreement actually triggered a lot of research that allowed us to better understand these possibilities. There was one study made on agriculture, and I think it's very much in, in agreement with what, what uh, the previous speaker was, was talking about. There are ways to, to transform agriculture to come to a much lower level of energy use, and it doesn't mean that you completely go vegan or that you completely go into starving uh, world population. Uh, this is for Europe, and it's, it's totally uh, possible to reduce uh, as the study has shown, to reduce by 40% the greenhouse gas emissions from, from agriculture if you, uh, if you install a set of measures that perhaps are not called sustainable intensification in this study, but uh, agroecological methods. <coughs> Coming back quickly as a second example, uh, because it's one that I feel very strongly about, is transport. The uh, transport sector, 14% of, of the emissions, and the interesting part of those emissions is that not only do they, um, do they disturb the climate, but they also disturb a lot of other things, uh, including public health. So, so there's this real big issue, can we actually do something about, uh, about transport emissions? And I think we all can, 
And I think we, each of us can think about ways to do it. I do not have the time now to give you detailed, uh, detailed studies. Maybe I need to jump over this next part because we're really running out of time. I wanted to show you that the, there's the Mediterranean effort on, on produ providing a synthesis um, of uh, environmental risks of environmental change. Uh, that's uh, an ongoing work which uh, is a little bit mimicking the global assessments by the IPCC and IPBES. Um, has many authors, many uh, very active people, but there's, I, I'm happy to answer questions about that at a later stage. I just want to conclude by making the point that civil society, and that includes us, uh, can do things that scientists cannot do. There, there has been the tradition of the science policy interfacing that I grew up with has been you are this objective scientist and you go to your uh, IPCC or IPES meetings, you write your report, you write them very neutral, not policy prescriptive, all of that, and then you go home, usually by air, by an airplane, uh, halfway around the planet, and you feel very good because you've given the information, but you're not actually doing anything. And I think we have to come, we have to go beyond this. Uh, we actually have to, um, if you want to have the multiple and profound transformations, then, uh, then we need uh, to do things that are illustrated by these hashtags, for example. You actually have to perhaps go on the streets on Fridays, which uh, many of the young people now are doing, and I, I really applaud them for that. I actually do believe, uh, this is not a scientific statement, but I do believe that since last year, we're seeing a dramatic change in public opinion and public recognition of the global change problems thanks to the students that go on the streets in, uh, on, on, on Fridays. And they're supported, of course, by parents and by scientists and by others. And, uh, and I, re I realize this is being noticed if you, if you actually talk about ways to reduce uh, the emissions. This, this is just today from, from Publico, the interview I gave yesterday. Um, so, so there is a willingness to recognize this, but it means we all have to act ourselves. And we should not stop any, uh, let anyone stop us speaking up about these, these matters. Uh, so I invite you to, to all speak up and, and do what you can in order to reduce the environmental pressures on the planet. Thank you very much. Okay, so we now have time for questions. Anyone raising their hand? Everyone needs lunch. No. Many thanks, Wolfgang, for this very nice presentation. Uh, again, uh, particularly the, the first part left me a little bit with despair. No? It seems that those that we are living in the Mediterranean and we are living further south, we are in Alicante. So I would like to, to ask you, what do you think that is going to happen in the Mediterranean? Because it's not only a hotspot for all these reasons, but I'm also particularly worried about the migration, because it's one of the main migration routes at the moment, coming from, from Africa, right? Mm. So what are, what are your opinion about what is going to happen in 20, 30, 40 years? Yeah, of course, I'm not the, the, the right person to predict, and maybe nobody can predict uh, the, the migration in, in, uh, at the level of decades. And, and I think, again, Ricardo already made this, this point very nicely yesterday that uh, a lot of migration, uh, a significant part of migration is clearly triggered by environmental change, not by the political problems, although there is a very strong and difficult to disentangle interaction between, between the two. Um, but it's clear that if we let this go unmitigated, and if we uh, accept a further decrease in, in living conditions on the southern and side and eastern side of the Mediterranean, we produce more migration. That is, that is almost, I wouldn't say a law, but this kind of uh, unavoidable. So, so if we uh, put this positively, then I think the mitigation efforts that we put in, first of all, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, they will also have repercussions on the mitigation, on the migration problem. But then afterwards, we, we still have to deal with the living conditions that make people want to move. And that's a non-climatic issue. Thanks. One other question. Or is everyone just thinking of lunch? Oh, lunch. Yeah, seems like it. <laughs> um, I was surprised to see no change in tourism as a result of all these changes. So, ah. what's the reason? I mean, uh, from the 
south now they will go north instead of what was happening till now? What's, what's the reason of this steady state of see. tourism? Where is she? <laughs> She's there. Okay. Here I am. <laughs> ah, <Here>. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I jumped over tourism a little quickly, and there's, of course, a lot of studies about that. And the question that northern people like myself uh, are often being asked is how hot can it get before you stop going to the Mediterranean? And, uh, and it turns out that uh, northern people are still coming to the Mediterranean despite the heat waves. I do not think that the heat waves have generated a significant reduction, some reduction, but not a significant reduction in, 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 uh, in tourism to the Balear Islands or to, to the Algarve or to, to, to other parts of the Mediterranean. Or not to, I even know people from southern France who in the middle of the heat wave went to southern Turkey because they wanted to be on the beach of southern Turkey. So t it appears to be, and I think there's some evidence for that, that tourists are not yet showing much of an impact. But that, if you look at the, at the graphs I showed from the Mediterranean cities, there will be a limit to that. And uh, where, where it is, we don't know. But uh, I think if, if we get the, the amount of uh, extra warming in the summer that these studies indicate, then tourism will be, will be affected. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's uh, time to wrap up and go for lunch and thank all. Please don't go yet. <laughs> Wait, wait. Volunteers, close the doors. <laughs> Where is it? So. So, the announcements now. The session T9 P10 will be on room 2221, not in 2215, as you have in your badge. Okay, 2221. There are awards at the conference, three best oral communication awards in which you can vote, and four best poster awards in which one you can vote on transmitting science booth. For the oral ones, you have here the link, and it's all, all information are in the, our website. Go to the tag about the Congress and then communication prizes. Yes, take photos. I'm giving time. Okay. For the, no? Have you taken? Yeah, okay. Okay, perfect. Then you can choose your favorite poster at the Transmitting Science booth. You only have to write down in a piece of paper the code of the posters. Every, every poster has that code. T, X represents the, the topic and PO, the poster, and Y, the number of the poster. Okay, just write that. T, something, dot, PO, something. The Life Watch will be presenting uh, from lunch and from 13.30 to 14.30, so don't miss their presentations in the cinema area at the C6 building. Tonight we have the Congress dinner, so don't get lost. If you need any information about how you should go there, please ask the volunteers and us. And now, photo time. Okay, so Vasco, where is Vasco? Vasco is here. You have to smile, two photos, okay, with different lo logistics, so pay attention, please. First one, Vasco will capture you sitting, so you have to smile, okay? And then Vasco will run to the... No, Mariana is there. Say hello, Mariana. Mariana is there, you can see her. So she'll take a photo from there. You have to stand here and look up, okay? After, after this one, okay? Okay, doubts? Everything okay? Smile, don't forget to smile, please. Okay, the people that are on this side have to do like this, or <laughs> half go to the back or to the corridors, please. Okay, thank you. Wonderful people. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> ah. 
Oh my god, this actually is working. <laughs> Thank you. Volunteers, please fill the gaps. Can you Thank you. No, this doesn't fall. <laughs> okay. Don't forget to have a second photo, okay? Don't leave. Volunteers at the doors. <laughs> Thank you. You are an amazing audience. Okay. So we start here. The best. Please come up to the stage if there is room. <laughs> this is excellent for networking. <laughs> Get to know each other, please squeeze a little bit. <laughs> You can also take selfies while you're like that, okay? <laughs> Hashtag EF Lisbon 